So welcome to the Wine and Food Experience, where you're going to get to experience wine and food. <laughs> so uh, the wine that's coming around is Gurgich Hills Fumé Blanc, 2008 vintage. So which was part of our first segment tonight, where we had it on its own, talking about biodynamic farming. So what we're going to what we're going to do here, our mission is to see how foods and flavors can alter our experience of a wine. So what we had earlier was our experience of the Gurgich Fumé. Everybody had a slightly different experience. Generally, you know, the crowd was in loud, roar-fold appreciation. And now where we're going to head is to see what we can do to um, change this flavor. When we look at the idea, we're going to take on an idea. So the idea we're going to take on is what if wine was meant to be an ingredient that's part of a dish. So where we were talking about biodynamic farming before, I mentioned the idea that natural wine often doesn't show its full dynamic or its magic when you just enjoy it on its own. It's more like it'll come out in really interesting ways when it's paired with things that it wants to be paired with. So how do we know what to pair with different wines? Well, that's a good question. And that's what we're going to spend the next 20 plus minutes figuring out. So here we have the magical ingredient, lemon. So this represents the magical world of tart. Um, so what I'd like you guys to do before we adventure into this is have two sips of this wine. And as you taste this wine, I'd like you to notice what you notice on the first sip and on the second sip. And just see if you notice any difference. You're getting happy. You're having fun. <laughs> Uh -huh. so, you, so after you do it one first time, you want to do it a second time. So you're going to do two tastes, and I will then ask you guys a question. I think I'm going to fail. Why? <laughs> I didn't notice any difference. Okay, that's okay. So let's just say, for how many of you guys did you notice a difference? Just in those two tastes. All right. Maybe a little. So what's interesting is the first taste is wherever you were before, plus that wine. Yeah. So whether it's simple body chemistry, or it's something that you just had, whether it's a wine, a food, a beverage, a sweet, a tart, or anything. So the second sip is where you're actually tasting the wine more on its own and seeing what the flavor is like on its own. So now, so how many people do you know running around where a slice, where e munching on a lemon is a really yummy, happy thing that they just love to do and have to do every day. Mm. Okay. But probably not a whole heck of a lot. So the thing is, how many people do you know where, who put lemon on fish where to not would be preposterous? So it's an ingredient. And the flavor that's dominant here is not sweet, it's not salty, it's specifically tart. So what happens is that we are now going to experiment in the realm of take a slice and pass. And now having tasted, having tasted this wine, what we're going to do is, is see how this wine changes when it's exposed to something tart. So go ahead. Um, facial expressions are highly recommended. Um, and take a nice bite out of the piece of lemon. So get that flavor experienced. <laughs> what? Uh huh. Okay, I'm salivating already. Right. <laughs> Just the thought of it. Lemon. We should be no laughing at the gallery. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Once you've lemonized yourself, wine. Go wine. Are they gonna be doing yes. We can. Perfect. To hand out the plates would be great. Discard mm. plates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, so the grapefruit's gone. Yeah. Ah! Oh, okay. Hold on to that thought. That was that was one of the bonus questions that that was one of the that was one of the bonus questions that gets you one of these. <laughs> yes, you get a conscious wine bag. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, you all get conscious wine bags for coming today. So, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Hey, you know what? I just needed that little shot. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's seen the most clever now of all of us. Ah, 
Uh huh. <laughs> what, what was the comment? The buttery tones were really brought out. Awesome. So what happens is you get to learn, and on the sheet, you have the food flavor. So you're welcome to write your notes here if you want about how the wine is with that particular flavor element. On the back of this magical piece of paper, you have the number one, two, and three. You will now get wine and pairing rule number one that you can use at home, which is like goes with like. Absolutely. We're in biodynamic farming and wine and food. So, so what does like goes with like means? What happens is when you have a tart wine with a tart, so this wine, you guys notice this wine had really good acidity, good tartness on its own. So you do a tart wine with a tart food and one flavor after another, all of a sudden neither tastes tart. And it allows the next thing to come out. So, and what came out for you was butteriness. What came out for anybody? You, I heard something else over here. That other flavor, some, I, the tartness was gone. And different things happen. So it starts to change the flavor, the personality, and the nature of the wine. All we did here is add tart. So now, for how many of you, just let's start right here. How many of you just preferred this wine on its own? Or preferred, so if you vote for, did you prefer this wine on its own? Or did you prefer this wine with that tart element with it? So how many people preferred the wine on its own? How many people preferred the wine with the tart element? OK, interesting. This is just one experiment, one idea of a wine and food possibility. So if we look at wine all the way on its own over here as all alone and keep it in that box or cage, the experience we can have with it becomes fairly limited. And what I wrote, because I couldn't help myself, the magic is in the mystery. So when you get back into the world of all the wonderful people who have gathered, you know, with all our interesting thises and thats and all this stuff. And you guys have a conversation and you guys have a conversation. And the next thing you know, you start to mix the elements. You don't know what's going to, you don't know what's going to come out of that. That's where life happens. That's where the magic is. So the magic is in the combining. You know, we have this habit with wine where we look at wine as an isolated entity and we miss the story. And with natural wine, specifically with conscious wine, it's all about the story. You know, so how do we dig into the story? So this is one simple way. So the goal here is we're going to look at this one wine and see what it does with tart, fat, earth, and spice. That's where we're headed. So that was tart. That was number one. OK, everybody should have gotten a plate. OK, um, we will get plates for everybody. Once you have your plate, bread. Once you have bread. You get to pour olive oil on your bread. OK? So, and we sell napkins for $10 a pop if you need one. <laughs> no, kidding. So what did you say, like? Like goes with like is the first rule. OK, so pour a little olive oil on the bread. I, I will tell you in advance that we're going to be working with bread and olive oil three times. So, so if, you want to, if you want to take a bite and do it this way, um, you can do it so the one piece of bread could serve your three purposes, or you can have a three pieces of bread, or three pieces of bread and make three little stories for yourself. And then we'll have something uh, fun at the end. Scott, we wanted to grab the the pesto. Is that here the artichoke lemon pesto that Beverly was going to grab? Yeah, thanks. All right, get ready. Okay. Oh, olive oil, olive oil is coming. Okay. So, so a Gurgich Hills um, Fumé Blanc tell you a little bit about what I love about Gurgich. Each wine from them is unique. They do, they do a Fumé Blanc, which is the Sauvignon Blanc grape varietal. They do Chardonnay. They do a Reserve Chardonnay. They do Zinfandel. They do Merlot. They do a couple of different Cabernets. All their wines are so unique and have been so consistently unique for over a decade um, that it's been, always been one of my favorite wineries. And when I discovered that they were biodynamic, and made wine naturally, I was all the more stoked about the deal. Um, Gurgich Fumé um, is one of my favorite California Sauvignon Blancs, mostly because of the diversity in the flavor. It's got a richness, but it also, has, it also has beautiful acidity. It has really nice aromatics. And as you're about to discover, there's more to discover. OK, so now what I'd like you guys to do is dip away. And there is a little more wine if the wine glasses get empty. And you're trying, you're bringing now in, as opposed to tart element, you're bringing in the fat 
element with the olive oil. You want to make sure that you get, if you need to do two tastes, to make sure you get the taste of the fat of the olive oil, do that. I can see you're not making it through the round, so. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to a little more over here, too. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it really balanced everything. Comment here is it really balanced everything out. Interesting. And what, is, what does that mean to you? Well, I'm not picking up the overly acidic that uh -huh. I'm picking up. It was just everything is, is just blended, mellowed together. Ah. Interesting. Anybody else? You, you agree with that? Uh-huh. Anybody else over have any? What's that? OK. It's more fruity and not as buttery. Good. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. So it brought out the fruitiness. Now, one thing about, so this wine has a very nice, this wine has a, so I'm going to give you another like, like goes with like example. This wine has a very nice earthy element in it. And one of the things about olive oil is it doesn't come off as overly earthy, but it still comes from the earth. And this wine also has a fruity element to it. You, you said it came out fruitier to you, right? Mm -hmm. So the earthiness in the two things actually played off each, uh, each other a little bit. And for you, as opposed to the butteriness or the texture that it brought out before, in this case, it brought out the fruit. And all wine is fermented ripe grape juice. So when we balance these elements together, it's the fruit flavors that are one of the things that'll come out. A great example of this, is um, there is a, my, my most profound example ever was with a grape type called Nebbiolo, N-E-B-B-I-O-L-O, -O, which has its home in the Piedmonte region in northern Italy. The other thing that comes from that soil is white truffles, which sell for going towards $2,000 a pound. And in the season that we are now approaching, late fall, they shave a little bit onto an orchestra of plain foods, like a simple pasta, even scrambled eggs, you know, or a little bit on risotto. And it just creates this earthy wildness. It's incredibly earthy and aromatic and flavorful. And what happens is, if you try that, Nebbiolo is like earth and leather as a grape varietal. And so on. Earthy, leathery, dry, acidic, tannic, the thing that makes your teeth, lips, and gums feel like they're stuck together. Um, so what happens is when you try the white truffle or something, white, something with white truffle and get that flavor in your mouth and then you try the Nebbiolo-based wine after it, the, the two earthy elements based on like goes with like nullify each other out and the whole fruitiness of the Neb Nebbiolo grape, which is a beautiful red fruit flavors, comes out. And so that's where you get access to that. You don't get access to that by just going after the wine on its own. And in, the, in that particular wine, it's not even available until you get it paired up like that. So um, how many people preferred this wine on its own, the flavor on its own? And how many people preferred it with the fat? All right, so interesting where we went with that, right? So we're definitely kicking it along here. OK, so now what you're going to do is we're going to do bread again with the oil. This time you have your choice. Organic herbs are coming your way. Take a little bit. We'll start time out over here and oregano here. So bread, olive oil, and an herb. Draw a little bit on top. Lasagna is coming at the end, yes. Jumped ahead. We're, we're good in what we got to do, but I have to give you wine and food pairing rule number two. And, and anybody want to guess what number two is? Like goes with like was number one. Wine and food pairing rule number two? What happened in the last flight? What's the deal with, what's the deal with, with lemon and fish? What's the deal with what happened in the last flight? Lemon and fish? It cancels out the... Opposites attract. Rule number two, opposites attract. So we have like goes with like and opposites attract. So think about that a second. If you have something really tart, and you have it with something that's, when you're cooking, you have that with something that's fatty, the fat will make the tartness seem less tart, and the tartness will make the fattiness seem less fat. I mean, I love, it's interesting how we love desserts like key lime pie, you know, or something lemony, you know, a lemon custard, you know, or something like that. It, you have the tart and the fat together. 
that are where the opposites attract. And whereas individual components, fat on its own, you know, acidity on its own, you bring them together, they make each other work together. That's where you get the whole. And if we're trying to support vineyards who are doing holistic farming, we're getting, attu we're getting tuned into that here too. So there's a connection because seeing the way these foods come together just gets us thinking about things from a more holistic point of view. How do things fit together? And then that might start to shift our choices. Next thing we know, we'll be choosing wines that do some of these fun little things. And next thing we know, we'll maybe be choosing electric cars. Who knows? <laughs> No. So the opposite would be, the opposite here would be fat and acid. So the acidity in the wine and the fattiness in the wine bring out, uh, balance out each other. The, in terms of the fruity part, that was a like goes with like because it's the earthiness in the olives and it's the compared with, paired with the, um, uh, the earthiness in the wine that nullified both of those things making room for the fruitiness to come up, come to the surface. You know, anybody, has anybody ever heard of like, you know, ever heard, uh, like Chianti from Italy? It tends to be a really tart wine. But one of the things with, with Chianti is that uh, it's made from a grape called Sangiovese. It has really racy, really good acidity. When wine people, they like to call strong acidity racy acidity. It's like juicy, it's racy. So um, that goes great with things with tomato sauces and stuff because they're both tart. So when you have them together, neither one tastes tart anymore. You know, uh, one of the, old, one of the, the funnier uh, descriptions of Chianti I, I heard in the old days would be cherry and spice and not so nice. Because it meant that the flavors were kind of a little spicy, a little red fruit cherry-like, but the acidity was really strong and it was just dry in the mouth. But when you do it with food, when you do it, with, and especially with, with food like garlic and tomatoes, with, you know, which are strong, and, and the acidity in the tomatoes, they nullify each other out. So if you have that tomatoes in your mouth, you know, first and then have the Chianti or that type of wine, it doesn't taste so strong anymore. Okay, so everybody, so play with the earth element and then we will see what happens. Okay, and, and you guys feel free to try it with the two different herbs too. You know, feel free to, feel free to, try, feel free to try it with the two herbs also. Is there such thing as smoky? Absolutely. I think I taste that. As a matter of fact, this wine has a lot of smoky in its nature. So absolutely, the herb element could definitely bring out the smokiness. That would be, that, matter of fact, that would have, matter of fact, you just got a shirt. Oh, oh no, yeah, we'll give you a bag. We don't have, forget the shirt idea. Shirts are, okay, Whoa, you win. You. <laughs> oh. Okay, you're cut off. <laughs> That's right. The acidity is completely gone. Okay. I think I tripped. I just took a lot. I just like. I think I tripped you. And the herb right there is getting I just. Oh, I don't know. It became very. I think it's more than Let's publicize some comments in the group as to what did that experience do for you guys. Let's hear some things. It, I think it lost the acidity from It lost the acidity, so it took too much away. Oh, no, not too much away. That's just what I liked it. Uh huh. I got it at the end. You got the acidity at the end. And we're looking at it. Ah, that's a very interesting comment. Uh huh. Good. Adding the herb got more of the butteriness back. Yes. Uh huh. Good. Good, good. So. So you guys are definitely getting a feel here for how, it, how these very simple elements really create a dynamic difference in one, in one wine. Is that correct? You're seeing how it's really creating a dynamic difference in just a single wine. Okay, next, one more element. Pepper. Okay, so olive oil and pepper. And if you have a little herb in there, that's fine, but you might want to clean off the herb. Or So anyway, pepper mill is around for... For your entertainment. <coughs> so I'll tell you guys, yeah, uh, it's really interesting because we're just working with simple elements here. So imagine when you get a dish going. Now, you know, think of what you can do with, with, a smoked, with a smoked fish. 
So we've got a fish that would be oily or textured, have the fat element going. And then you could add the smoke element, which will also accent it in salt. But it adds this other richness. And that actually really brings the fruitiness out in a wine like this. This would be good so, with salmon? What's that? This would be really good with salmon? Um, it, would, it, would, it would be good with a lot of different things. You know, salmon, salmon likes different herb elements. So if you like what happened with the herb factor, you might, I mean, think of what goes with salmon. So what do people tend to put on salmon? Yeah, OK. So you know, you've got to think, so then you could say, OK, how did the herb seem to affect this wine? If you like the way it affects it that way, then yes. You know, so, so one thing we're going to do in the future, I think that's really going to be wonderful, is we're going to do wine and food experiences in the form of a dinner, where imagine you go to a wine dinner, and you have a, f a different wine with each course. We're going to actually serve a four-course dinner where you will have the same wine for all four courses, and you will think you've had four different wines. Wow. It's magic. It's magic because the magic is in the mystery. Yeah. <laughs> you got your, you got, you, 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 you. That was, that was good. That was good. Sorry. So, so last week, yes. I brought this wine to my brother. Uh huh. And my sister in law served a pumpkin uh -huh. that she baked. Yeah. But the inside was. Bread yeah. and cream yeah. and butter. Yeah. And I think, um, Sounds good. I know. It's fantastic. <laughs> but it made the character of the wine so much more fruit uh -huh. than, um, than it is than here. So uh -huh. it was really uh -huh. so interesting how different it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And we're going to come to a fun little thing in a few minutes that'll help make that point. Um, OK, you guys playing with this with the pepper? Has the pepper mill made its way around? OK. Mm -hmm. What's that? I, I, acidic to mm -hmm. me. OK. Brings back, brings back that. Cleans it up. Yes. It cleans it up. <laughs> you win it. Oh, you got one ready. <laughs> um, it, just, it just brought everything, just eliminated everything. Well, I mean, then what, you taste what, what, it, what it does to me, to, what I love with the pepper is it, it heightens everything mm -hmm. to me. It just brings it, it it's, it's like the, right. the, the pepper's got this aromatic that's, and for me, it takes the wine and it, Right. It Cleans makes it. The fat, I think I meant. It, t it, it moves that. It makes the nose more. The, the nose comes out and gets me more now. It reaches out for me more. The aroma, mm -hmm. and then the, the certain things stand out more again. Like the acidity stands out a little more. We still have the fat, but notice here. All we did. We still have the fat, but notice how different yeah. it is between the pepper and the herb, and yeah. that's all you added. You still had the fat yeah. as the base, and you yeah. just added one additional component, and it really changed it like that. That's pretty fun. It did. And you know, so, if, yeah. so in your own worlds of creativity, I mean, the bottom line here is get creative. Have fun. And actually, I'm going to jump ahead. And Scott, could you pass out the, the next piece of the moment? No. We have a treat. And, and this you can try with the, with, on the bread, if you like, or without. And this is? What do we have here, Scott? Uh, this is uh, artichoke lemon pesto. So, oh, are you kidding me? So we have artichoke. <laughs> we, have, we have earth of artichoke. We have lemon. We have garlic. We have salt. Um, we have basil. So we have all those different flavors in here. So let's see what this is going to do to the wine. So try this and see what it does with the wine. <laughs> this is the fun I stuff. I killed it. I just thought it was the end. What's that? We weren't ready for the surprise. Ah. <laughs> yeah, there was one more. What, there, I know. There was one more surprise for you there. You paced yourself really well. Thank you. I thought the pepper was the last one. We'll put a plate over and luckily a lemon right just make sure you save some for us, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So find me a glass up there, please. Uh, yeah. And you too. <laughs> it's helped the flavor. The finish is so much longer. 
Ah! You are touching into the third rule. She got her bag yet? Yeah. She said she. Ah, you just got the bag. Okay, you're tapping into the. You're tapping into the third rule. Uh, she can repeat what she said, and then she gets her prize. Oh yes. So, so May Lee, this is for you. And the comment was that it made the wine much longer. It made the finish last longer. Correct? It made the wine feel like it was. It just kept going and going. Isn't that a major goal? <laughs> it's actually. It's actually the th rule number three. Rule number three in wine and food pairing rules is, what's number one? Rule number two? Rule number three is, anybody want to guess? Match the weight. Match the weight. Light wine goes with light food. Heavy wine goes with heavy food. The one thing that we did not have an alignment up to this point was we weren't matching the weight of the food of what we were trying with the wine. As soon as we did that, look at what just happened. So turned into an elegant sort of exactly turned into an elegant turned into an elegant wine exactly. So you have a real heavy food with a cab. Yep. You have a lighter food with a pinot. Correct. That's right. And pinot you can do like salmon works great. Duck works great. Chicken. You know, even works with you know works with Pinot. It's not where you're going to want to go with steak or meat, you know. But it's you know you could do it with some pork dishes, you know, depending, you know where where you go. But match the weight. That's really key. <coughs> and look at all these beautiful flavors. We had the lemon interacts with the, this wine in, in this last offering of, of food flavors. We have lemon works with this. We have the fat in there works with this. We have the herbal element in the basil and, and the artichoke that works with this. Haven't you heard, any of you guys heard that artichokes you can't have with wine ever? You know, it just kills wine. I don't know if it's a wine, not in this case. All these other elements dancing together, it's beautiful because you've got the fat the, and you've also got salt. And the, the oiliness of fat, it, it's almost like it's a highway that things can rest in. You know, oil becomes a container. And so all these other flavors can work in here, and then the earthy elements can dance together. And you get this really beautiful, for lack of a better phrase, you know, intoxicating dance between these elements where the lines between the wine and the food gets lost. And it becomes a better experience as a holistic experience that brings you on a journey, that takes you on a journey. And that's the magic of wine and food. And that's a, a, great, a great opportunity. All right, one more thing, not to taste, just to hear. Okay, in this, hot tip. Hot tip. If you taste a wine you hate, don't fret. Celebrate. Go to your fridge and grab the nearest food with no sugar in it whatsoever. Get the flavor of the food in your mouth and try the wine again. Get ready to smile. For extra smiling, try this experiment with multiple savory foods. So if wine, back to where we started, if wine is meant to be an ingredient that's part of a dish and we don't like a wine on its own, maybe we're just not looking at it for what it is mm -hmm. and what the nature of wine truly is. So bring in food, whole new world. So thanks, guys. Any, any questions at this point? Yes. Ah, in, yes, in the. Or wait, maybe I was. Talking yeah. So there was there was a question uh, earlier in the day about um, aerating wine, and and what was the question exactly? Do you remember? Oh, I've seen those little aerators that you put on the. Yes. The bottle. Right. Right. I mean, what's the difference between that and decanting? Um, the so de decanting is just going to get more volume of air into the wine. And as you mix that volume of air into the wine, the wine will start to open up like a good story or like a good book. So the aerator itself will just get a little bit of air into it to start the process. The idea is based in this concept that wine is released from the winery most of the time too young, goes to the retailer too young, the retailer sells it to you too young, and then you pull it off your shelf and drink it too young. 
So you never get to experience any of the secondary flavor development. Plus then we pull the cork because it's often been a hard day and we get home and we want the first sip of the wine to taste great. So meanwhile, all it needs is air starting going back a long time, you know, from back to the winery. It wanted to be held longer, it want, and then when you got it, it wanted to be held longer and rested, but it wasn't. And then when you open it, like we saw with the wines that were decanted, they really opened up and showed, you could see from in the, in the two decanters how the wines had changed and evolved. So you want to get air in there. So the aerator will start that process, but decanting is much better. So how do you know how to um, the magic is in the mystery. <laughs> yeah, experiment. I mean, that's the thing, because different wines are going to be different. So the more you can play with that, the better. And, and everybody's going to have their preference. Some people will like wines that are a little more this way, a little more that way. Some people like a little more acidity, a little more tannin, that dryness, a little more fruit. Um, everybody's a little bit different. So there aren't any hard, fast rules. You know, the idea here was really to give you enough tools so that you feel comfortable and excited about trying stuff like that. And you can always hire me to come and do a wine party. <laughs> Are there guidelines, Jeff? I mean, is it five minutes to 20 minutes, or? Uh, you know, um, n not really. I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing is with any young wine that's a well-made young wine, you want to get it out of the bottle into something to get air into it. So you really want to mix air in. Um, I'd say generally for decanting on, I would say, you know, at, at least an hour in something other than the bottle before you're going to drink it at home. If you've got big red wines that are, that you know are conscious wines, this kind of things that are on our website, which I'll tell you about in a minute, or, um, or natural or biodynamic wines, um, those wines, you know, I would say realistically, you know, you know, even if you're, gonna, if you're going out shopping in your day and you're serving it Saturday night for dinner, Pour it in a decanter, you know, like noon. So, so give, give yourself half a day, you know, to have that wine in a decanter. And it, it'll start to soften up. It's almost like it's been, imagine it's almost like it's been going to the gym and doing its thing, and it's kind of like all pumped up. But you've got to go for a walk after. You've got to go settle down after. Sometimes you go lay down and you settle back into your breath and your skin and your wholeness. You've got to kind of, you got to come back into yourself. So. Huh. So as far as aging. Yes, aging wine. Reds versus white. Yes. Is there a difference? You know, everybody thinks that the aging is more red oriented, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily true. Because that's what I've heard. Exactly. So it depends on the style of the wine, how it's made, and what it is. You can definitely age white. Certain white wines, um, there are Chenin Blancs from the Loire Valley that will age beautifully for four, 30, 40 years. That's so, how we know as a consumer. Ah, you, it's a tricky one. So if you want to, once again, you know, it's a way you can ask me and check in. Or, you know, Beverly here at Harry and David is a great resource for all that kind of stuff. So the way you learn that is by practice. And, and the tasting group or making friends with people who are, you know, winos. I like to spell it W-I-N-E-K-N-O-W. You know. Any more questions? And your question was a complicated question. So asking about how long to age and the distinction between red and white is not a simple, you know, I, I can say, you know, I've been into wine, I've been into wine since I'm my, actually, way before I was legal. Mom and dad went to Italy two years in a row when I was a kid, and that's that, exactly. Can't you tell? So, you know, and, and it's, it's years and years of trying and this and that, and part of what happens that's great is it's not just analytical. It's like a sense. It's like a new muscle of any kind. You're developing a sense, and you can, you can really learn. Um, and if you tr let's just say if you start to trust that sense, It'll take you down great roads. It'll really take you down great roads. And part of it is, is going to be through tasting. So one of the things that you guys can do is form a tasting group amongst yourselves. And, and then what you do is you um, pick a budget, pick a topic, and then don't, don't just bring a lot of low-end wine, but actually pick a topic that's fun for you, and then you know, look at how much the bottles cost in that. You know, An average bottle these days of something that's interesting, that's got some mystery to it, is going to be in the $30 range. So, you know, f work it in so you've got enough, if you have 12 people together, you know, maybe you have like four or five wines and taste them. You know, so it doesn't have to cost much money. And that way you can taste stuff and then make a potluck around it. Well, yes, yeah, so, I had a wine tasting group that I was for a couple of years and then uh -huh. um, I was telling Peter and of course, you know, it, it all... It was the end. The beginning was the end. It was, you know, we all, you know, 
would make, I started the whole food thing. Uh huh. Yeah. And I didn't necessarily pair the foods with, it was just whatever new recipes that I wanted to try on the <laughs> guinea pigs. Ah, uh huh. So uh -huh. anyway, um, it, we got away from the learning, mm -hmm. but, um, but it, it was fun and we would, you know, pick a varietal and, and, um, and, and then we'd always score, you know, our favorite to our least favorite out of the four bottles. Uh huh. Yeah. And everybody had different, you know, the one guy, his favorite was always my least favorite, and my <laughs> favorite was, yep. was his least favorite. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, um well, but, mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. so Peter said, yeah, once you bring food into it, it's all over. Yeah, Peter, so, <laughs> he's a purist. Part. So, he's Pe a purist. Peter, Peter's approach to me <laughs> is not where I'm interested at this point for me, because it's, it, it loses the holistic model that I'm, I'm into this at this point and doing conscious wine because I think how we explore this can help us make more conscious choices in our life outside of wine. I think we're cultivating habits here that really bring us to places where we'll naturally, by, get, by cultivating some of the things we've learned here, by actually, that will lead us to making more sustainable choices in other things almost automatically without even having to think about it. This is subtext. Yeah. So P Peter's approach, I'll, I'll get there in just a sec. And Peter's approach is just very, is, is really just about the wine. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's, um, for, for me, um, I am interested in the chicken with the head. So that's, that's I, I me and my approach. Food. I mean, that yeah. Was, and, the best part. Yeah. Really and, what, and you know what happens with the food too is the whole combination. The whole combination. The whole, and, and, it's, and it's interactive, and it supports community, and it supports this beautiful place of nourishment. It supports connection to the land. You know, it allows things like the slow food movement and all different kinds of things, or the 100 Mile Club, and all these different things that you can start to relate to that, that support the local dynamic from, from, doing, from understanding where do things come from, and what am I supporting when I put my dollars in something? You know, what did I just do? You know, and, and back at the beginning when I was talking about the fist, you know, we get so programmed into certain habits, whether it's Costco or whatever, from, our, from what we're taught or what we believe, that we don't necessarily cultivate, take the time to cultivate habits that are more sustainable, that are more natural, and that support sustainable things that we really want for ourselves and for our kids and for their kids. You know, and we can really have an impact in that by our choices and absolutely in wine. And <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, and I just want to say, on Conscious Wine on our website, all the wines that are on there, everybody that's on there, all fits this stuff. I vet all the wineries, and we don't charge them a penny so to them. So we buy, because I'll buy wines here yeah. and at the grocery store. Yeah. So when we did the, you know, this has been open 48 hours, 24, or whatever. Right. Then some will go bad and some won't. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. When you buy wines, when you buy conventional wines, um, a, great little, a great little line that I like is conventional farming is like antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Organic farming is like vitamins. And biodynamic farming is like yoga. So, so, so when, when you do... With a little label on it, we should be good to go as far as if, it, if it's cork sitting on the counter for... Uh, the, it, yeah, I wish it was that simple. <laughs> it's, and that's why we do conscious wine. So the reason it's not that simple is because we have two things here. So here's this block, right? And in this block lives... Um, grape growing and farming. And in this block lives winemaking. And the bridge between the two doesn't always work out exactly right. So just so they're doing the things they need here to get the Demeter, that, that approval stamp, that Demeter stamp for made from biodynamically grown grapes, that doesn't have to tie in to a quality finished product here. So with Conscious Wine, our four principles are all the wineries we have are 100% organically grown grapes, sustainably or what we like to say holistically farmed, which includes things like biodiversity. Then we say creating vital products, like we talked about, which is this idea of how these wines open and change. And the fourth principle of conscious wine is they have to be good. If it's not a quality product, we're back to that problem with organic wine that we had in the first place. Yeah, I've had some bad. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so you might like conscious wine. <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Go go. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. You told. To me, opening yeah. a bottle of wine, yeah. the cork and everything is like, I don't know, part of the, that that ritual. That's part of the experience. Part of the ritual. And I noticed a big thing is the, in fact, you guys have one here, mm -hmm. is the um, screw top. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? Does that mm -hmm. change the wine at all? Mm -hmm. Or is it just 
purely a mind over matter thing? It's an interesting adventure. Um, so the debate is cork is a renewable resource. So in the cork forest, they, the way they, they don't chop down the tree. It's peeled off, it's cut off the tree. And then they'll harvest um, a, a crop from the same forest, I think, every eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. Additionally, there's really good biodiversity, especially animal wildlife, in the cork forest in Portugal. So cork is a sustainable resource. Stelvins and the different kind of closures that are synthetic are made from synthetic things that are mined. Now, if something, let's say, is made from something like aluminum, where it is recyclable, that's fine, but what percentage of it actually ends up getting recycled? You know, and it's still being mined. And how is that mined? And what is being affected, what's happening to the earth where these things are mined? And if we really want to get into digging a little deeper, you know, when it comes to environmental sustainability, the big, the other piece to connect into that is social justice. You know, how are the, how are the people being treated, you know, who are doing those mining and all these things? So, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of questions there. Now, from a simple wine point, so from a natural point of view, I much prefer cork, um, and from a sustainability point of view. From a wine point of view, the one issue is about 8% of all wine, and that's a lot, 8%, has some element of something called cork taint. So the wines can taste and smell corked based on a reaction that happens, based on a component that can be there from, from bad cork. So that's a real problem. Now, what percentage of the consumers out there realize what a bottle is corked? That's also, it's not 100% for sure. So what percent is a question. But economically, some people like to do the, the screw caps and stuff because um, you know, they don't have corked bottles. And they can still keep the oxygen out and the wine will age. So it's, a, it's an interesting debate. Does that help? So it really doesn't make a difference in the flavor of the wine. I have had, I've, I've kept wine for 20 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've had wine that's gone bad because I didn't, I guess, keep it at the right temperatures or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when I opened it, it was, it was bad. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the wine. It's with a cork. It depends on the wine. Sometimes oxygen can get in there, and oxygen will break the wine down. Same way it'll air the wines in the decanters. Mm -hmm. Over time, it'll also, oxygen opens the wine, and oxygen breaks it down eventually. So and it's a question of at what point does that happen? And, uh, and cork can be a problem. Air, the cork can dry out, air can get in there, and it starts to break things down. So depending how you stored the wine and some other variables, it, it's a, there are variables. But you know, do you want the variables of the possibilities of what's natural, or do we want to go to something synthetic? You know, it's a, there's, a, there's absolutely a split and a strong debate out there. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, I lean towards the cork. OK, I do too. I do too. I have a question for you. Yes. Um, in the food flavors, yes. you have an omission. We have what? An omission. Sweet? Yes. Ah, yes, we do. Um, so, if you want it, so two versions on sweet. Uh, if you want to, so the, the question was, I think everybody heard it, but the question was, what about sweet, as within, with all the flavors we did with wine and food? So, first, I'm going to talk about sweet that is not um, refined sugar. Okay, so let's take sweet in the form of a red pepper, okay? So if we would have added a red bell pepper into this mix, that is absolutely another, another thing to do. With this particular wine, the fruitiness in that would have taken away from the fruitiness of the, of the wine, and the wine would have tasted like a drier, earthier wine. Okay, so that's one thing, but it still would have tasted okay, just not as interesting as it did with some of the other elements. Um, it might have done okay with a little bit in there with the, uh, with the artichoke lemon pesto that we had. Um, sweet in terms of sugar, refined sugar, what happens is uh, it makes, well, sweet on its own, well, regular sugar makes the palate feel dull. So sugar in general, what happens if there is no refined, if there's no sugar left in the wine, if the wine is fermented dry, and you put it in the presence of sugar, it will always make the wine taste drier than it does on its own. So if you're looking for things that bring out the fruitiness in the wine, sugar will have an opposite effect. So whenever you have sugar with wine, you always want to make sure that there is at least as much sugar, if not more, in the wine than is in the food you're having with it. Is that? Yeah. Okay. It makes perfect sense. Okay. 
What's that? Great varietal that you would suggest with sure, like chocolate or with it? Like well, the, the whole idea about chocolate and dry red wine is a misnomer. I mean, basically what, what happens with chocolate, sweet chocolate, even if it's a dark chocolate but sweet chocolate with dry red wine, is there's some pairings where it doesn't make the wine taste like a dust bowl. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I would challenge you to find a situation where the chocolate with the wine actually makes the wine taste better than it does on its own. So what about a Madeira? A or That's a different story. And you've got, yeah, yeah totally different story. So, so like a dry Madeira? Uh -huh. a, okay, quick, dry Madeira and nuts. Yeah. Nuts. Oh, oh yeah. Uh -huh. Woo! Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm, yum. That's great. Great pairing. Great pairing. Um, now, okay, so we have dry Madeira, so we have bitter, and we have nuts. So we have these two elements that are nutty. So that's a like goes with like. Yeah. Um, so like goes with like, opposites track, match weight. There we go. Okay. Um, any more questions? Okay, so, so I hope you enjoyed the wine and food experience. And I hope you guys have fun with it at home. And, uh, Is this your first one? Yes, so I want to I want to just speak to a little bit about this little thing and about a little bit about conscious wine for just a minute. Um, so yes, this was the very first, the absolute number one first conscious uh, conscious wine roadshow ever. So yeah, yeah. conscious wine, conscious, woohoo! So conscious people. Hey, so okay, so, uh, so uh, and and as a business, just to tell you, our our vision for the business is to take responsibility for future generations by um, supporting conscious choices each and every day. Our mission for Conscious Wine is to tell the stories of wineries and vineyards that follow our four principles that I described in such ways that it empowers you to make those choices. Um, so that's our, our mission is using the wineries at this point to, to tell those stories. The idea for Conscious Wine started out of two frustrations. It started out of organic wine not equaling quality and wines from all over the world regardless of grape varietal being manipulated and manufactured into things that tasted the same. And those two things really got me upset one day. And in the middle of um, maybe that, that ancient wine dinner I told you about, um, I got inspired that there's such uniqueness in wine. And I know how I felt around that, how when I'm in these great things, it get, and I surrender my senses into it, it just livens me up. And it makes me want to tell great stories. It reminds me of wonderful things and community. And I was like, why can't wine be used, these unique wines be used, to remind us to live more in our own uniqueness and, and celebrate our own uniqueness and not have that take away from each other, but be a, an important part of our community again. You know, so I really thought there was a way to use wine to bridge that piece. And, and my interest has really been around sustainability. It's interesting, about five, six years ago, I was going to get out of the wine business. I was done with it. I didn't care anymore. It was too much business for me. And, and I just decided, and actually, this is great. I was at a raw food detox center dealing with a health food issue, uh, dealing with a health issue. Not a health food issue, dealing with a health issue. And I did this program for three months, and I really felt better, and all this crazy, wonderful stuff happened. And afterwards, I realized I still loved wine. And it was like, OK, what can I do with this? Because wine didn't fit that program I was in. And I was like, what can I do with this? And I decided that there were some wines that were really done in a way and made in a way where I think our systems respond to them in a more open, easy way. And that includes things like biodynamic farming, which on our website we call regenerative farming. And what we call, our, our, our technical medical term for it is no-nox, or non-inoculated fermentations. About 80% of wines in the United States add yeast for fermentation. Cowhorn's pretty much the only one I know down here that really doesn't on a regular basis. And, and so, and I noticed, so I noticed two things going back. I noticed one day, as being a lifelong wino, that um, four of my five favorite wines in the globe were farmed biodynamically, which made me curious about biodynamics. And then I discovered from a list I made that 17 out of my top 20 favorite wines from that particular list all shared not being inoculated in their fermentation, not having yeast added. So that was one of the things that led me to the experiment of looking at wines that are not inoculated and seeing how they unfold with time with oxygen, like what we did with Cowhorn. And that's where I've discovered this wonderful foundation that has become Conscious Wine. So the website, been working on it four years. The website launched in uh, April, on April 22nd on Earth Day. And uh, so some of the things that we're offering, we have lots of videos. We have a blog. We have a Facebook page. I'm going to give you a sheet here that has, uh, actually I'll pass this out to you guys. It's just a little bit so you've got my 
info on there. I think it's on the other sheets too, but here I'll give you. And there's a newsletter you can subscribe to and stuff like that. And two, three, four. Okay. And um, and I'm available for different stuff. Like if you'd like to do a class, um, you can hire me. So um, and that's definitely an, an option. So I come down here. I come down here about every six weeks or so. So to this area, I live up in the Willamette Valley right now. So I'm definitely available for hire for classes and events. Um, Ed and Jessica today filming. Um, thank you. And and Scott helping. Uh, Ed. So yeah. So good pours. So. So part of what this was about today is to create more gigs to do road shows. Cool. So that we're going to be putting together a marketing piece for, to create other speaking opportunities for Conscious Wine and for me and for stuff like that. So, so that's basically what we're up to. And uh, you know, thanks, everybody. Good. Well, thank you. So yeah. Yay. So and anybody who didn't get a bag, oh, and by the way, so the bags are made from 100% organic cotton and soy inks. The bags, yes. Da, 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 da. La la, la 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 la. <laughs> and if you keep going, you get all your way to vital. That's our tagline: vital choices for palate and planet. So, yeah.